let's get started. Um, so you are in one of the last sessions of the first day of DEF CON 31. Uh, and, um, and so the idea here is sort of a fireside chat. I mean, I'll be asking a lot of questions, but it's really more of a fireside chat with the acting uh, director of the Office of National Cyber uh, ONCD. And, um, and so then it's my pleasure to introduce Kemba Walton, the acting director of. Um, this is her first time at DEF CON. First time at DEF CON. Wait. What does it mean when it's your first time at DEF CON? And she's graciously accepted the challenge. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to uh, invite uh, Kemba to come up and say a couple of words. I was thinking of teasing out all these answers through all these questions. What is ONCD? What do you do? What is it like there? And it's like, no, just come up and tell us and we'll get through that quicker and we'll be more authentic and then we can move on to the questions. So with that, it's my privilege to introduce Kemba Walden. one around if that's okay. Yeah, if it's long it enough. Go? Is it long enough? Oh, it's not long enough. Here. So I'm vertically challenged. I'm trying to figure out a way to see you all. Can you see me? <laughs> you can? No, you can't see me, right? Oh, why don't you stand over here then? Okay, I'm going to stand over here. here. Great, now I can see you all. You can see me. Okay, good. Over there. I am Kemba Walden. I am the acting national cyber director in the White House. I want to tell you a little bit about what we do and who we are and how lucky I am to be in the White House working with some incredible folks. So before I get started, I want to just point to the front row uh, here at DEF CON. We have a whole staff here who are here to talk to you to help us design better policy. So who are we? Let's get this out of the way. We are the newest office in the White House. We were created by Congress in January of 2021. Uh, our first national cyber director, thank you. Our first national cyber director. Mm. Our first national cyber director was confirmed uh, and appointed in July. And we were appropriated, meaning that we got funding in November of 2021. I came into the office as second in command that following summer in June of 2022. So we were stood up by Congress to do one thing, and that was to develop national cybersecurity strategy and policy for the president and to advise the president as the primary advisor in the White House. We are designed to be a durable presence in the White House, no matter who the administration is, no matter what is going on in the White House at that time. We are designed to be there. Uh, so we will be there hopefully for years to come. Uh, so what have we been doing since we got there? We first aligned all of the federal departments and agencies that have cybersecurity responsibility. So that is CISA, DHS, you've heard from Jen Easterly, she's a fantastic partner. That is the Office of Management and Budget where the federal CIO sits and the federal CISO sits. That is the U.S. Secret Service, that's the FBI, that's the intelligence community, that is the Department of Energy, Health and Human Services, U.S. Department of Agriculture, and et cetera. They all have a role in cyber. So we were there to sort of orchestrate a common interest in cyber and to develop a national strategy. We did that with the help of you, with researchers, with civil society, with academia, um, with, with state and local entities, with my international partners. That was the first thing we did. We developed a national cybersecurity strategy. That was done and signed by President Biden in March of this year, March 2nd, 
2023, this year. After we did that, we then had to make it go, right? So we were novel in developing this strategy. We decided that we were going to pursue something affirmative this time, rather than sort of chasing after bad actors and having them define our agenda. And so we were going to decide how do we want to build a defensible, resilient digital ecosystem that's aligned with our values. And we discovered after doing a lot of research about what we've been doing for the last 20 years, and whether that's worked or hasn't worked, we figured out that we needed to make two major shifts. The first is recognizing that cybersecurity risk and responsibility is now devolved down to the least capable actors. You've heard me say before, if you were here at Black Hat yesterday, that if my children play Minecraft and they click on an interesting link on some other application, they could cause a national security crisis. That's not fair and it's inefficient and that scares me as a mom. We need to upscale that so that those that are more capable of bearing cybersecurity risk do. And that, I include the federal government, I include large enterprises, I include producers in that story. We are more capable of building a defensible digital ecosystem. But we know if you're in the risk business that you don't get to zero risk, you get residual risk. And so what do we do with that? We need to figure out what the investments are that we need to make in order to make cyberspace more resilient. Um, and that is if you take the proposition that cyberspace is technology, people, and doctrine, protocols, then you need to make it resilient all the way through, not just in the technology, but in the people and the protocols. So we're looking for a defensible cyber, a digital ecosystem and a resilient digital ecosystem. That's what we mean. And then we need to make, it, make sure it's aligned with our values. Technology by itself has no value. We put the value in it. People are a part of technology. We are in the internet. We are the users of the internet. We build the internet. It's unlike any other domain. It's not like land, space, sea, air. It is something that we've created. So we build values into cyberspace. And so what do we mean by that? How do we execute that? So that was the first thing that we did, one of the major things that we did. Right after publishing the National Cybersecurity Strategy, we worked with our counterparts in the Office of Management and Budget, uh, because if you don't have money, it's hard to make these things go. And we identified opportunities for federal departments and agencies, because I can't really instruct what the role does, but federal departments and agencies, how are they spending their money in cyberspace? So we help them prioritize. We're able to crack open budgets, and this is the wonky side of me. This is the superpower that we have in our office able to crack open those budgets and figure out where to put the money so that we can make the strategy go. The other thing that we needed then is action, because the strategy is only as good as its implementation. And so we produced, and the first time we did so in the White House, an action plan that's transparent. It's on the website. You can go and look there now. We have identified across 27 objectives in our national strategy. What are we doing? How are we going to implement this? There are 69 action items. We were thoughtful about it. We collaborated in order to figure out what those action items are. We identified departments and agencies that are leading on those action items and the, and the supporting entities. So ONCD, for example, my office is responsible for 14 of them. CISA is responsible for 10. The FBI is responsible several, for several, DOJ, et cetera, et cetera. And we put a deadline, a timeline on that, so that we are held accountable. The thing I couldn't do is to compel all of you to plug in. But the reason I made it transparent is not just to hold us accountable so that you can measure our progress, but so that you can tell us what we've missed or what will make it work better. This is a living document. The strategy is a durable document. It is there to sort of last for 10 years. It's Technology agnostic. I think you might see the words AI in there once, maybe quantum is in there, but it's technology agnostic. The living document is the action plan. How do we make this go? So that's the other piece we put forward. Now, personally, I'm a people person. I think that people are the most important element in cyberspace. Happy to, to take challenges and argue other ways, but I really do think people in that three-piece um, framework I just gave you is the most important part of cyberspace. And so we executed the National Cyber Workforce and Education Strategy. 
in order to make sure that people are more resilient, that they have the foundational skills that they need in order to be able to live in cyberspace in a, in a, in a good way, right? That is what I've been talking to many of you about. What are the cyber skills that we need? What are the skills that we need to make this a safer space? How do we teach kids? How do we make sure the entire population has foundational cyber skills? What does computational literacy look like? What does digital literacy look like? But then, for the urgent need of the 700,000 or 800,000 or whatever tens of thousands of jobs that are unfilled, what are the skills that we need in that space? So I've been talking to several of you today about what does AI do to the digital work workforce? How do we recruit you? How do you think about this? What do you do about federal workforce? How do we recruit you? How do we think about this? So those are the bil big building blocks of the work that we've done. And then there are some other opportunities that we've, we've identified. We've just published an RFI, meaning a request for information, so that you can tell us how to do our jobs better. That's the bottom line. That's why I'm here. And that's why I'm talking to Jeff today. I just need to know from you how to do our jobs better. We are in the White House for a reason, and that is to provide strategic cybersecurity advice to the president. You need to help me do that. I would be grateful for it. And with that, Jeff, if we want to sit down and have a chat. See, wasn't that better? <laughs> Me trying to get that out of a Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so thank you for coming. Um, it's a little bit like cheating. We ended up um, sitting next to each other at dinner last night, and so before we really get into the nitty gritty, um, maybe I will tease out of you. What did you do before this role? Oh. Right. I mean, you have chased bad guys and gone after some bad criminals, right? So. Oh yeah. And so. So one of the things I love about um, what I do is I'm mission oriented. Excuse me. So I was at Microsoft for a little while in uh, what is known as the Digital Crimes Unit. And I was asked to spin up uh, a, a, a counter ransomware piece of that Digital Crimes Unit. Find creative ways to go after the bad guys. Um, how do we use our Microsoft's tools to do that? How do we use the court system to do that? Right, and because you are a lawyer. I'm a lawyer. Right, so you know how to. Yeah. So you're more like a lawyer, legal hacker. <laughs> it's found yourself in the policy space. That's exactly right. And we're like the technology hackers finding ourselves in the policy space sometimes, right? I like uh, that, so. yeah. Um, so, yeah, you said a lot of things that, that I respond to. And, and so, the people in the audience, what we're going to try to do is have a little bit of a conversation so it's not just one sided. Um, so, hopefully, Kemba's got some questions for me. And we'll lots just of questions. <laughs> and so we'll work through it. So um, first, though, you the last thing you were talking about workforce. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that is a really hard one. It's been hard for decades. Yeah. You know, uh, how do you attract, retain, compensate, um, help people through their career? Um, and I was on this task force where we looked at cyber skills for the department, and. Uh, and we would find out that departments don't know the skill levels of their employees. So they're like, well, we've got people in antivirus, but we don't know if they're level one or level five or whatever. So we don't know if we need to hire more entry level or if we need to hire more experts. We don't know their skill level because we don't have a demonstration of skill like exam. We know they have a certification, but we don't really know how. And so it seems like to develop that workforce that you're talking about, we need to like, Calibrate well. How many level ones do we have? How many? How many are needed in the market? And mm -hmm. and so that was years ago. So I'm curious to see how has that evolved more from one department thinking about this to the White House thinking about it, uh, department and agency wide. Mm -hmm. um, and and then what do you do about it? You can't just throw money at this problem because you're the government and you don't really have much money. No, no but we have mission. Yeah, that's important, and that's why I'm in the government. It's because of mission. It's certainly not for the pay. Yeah. Um, so, you know, if you think about it this way, cybersecurity really facilitates everything we want society to, to bring us, right? We want, we want a digital ecosystem. We want to, for some reason, we plug our refrigerators in, we plug our dishwashers in, we have smart homes. Um, so we need, we need it to make sure it's secure in, in order to enable everybody to do the things that they want to be able to do. So we, we need to think bigger about 
upskilling. Um, who are we bringing into this space? We need different perspectives in mm -hmm. order to be able to do this effectively. The, the one thing I worry about um, is if you have gatekeepers, like you have the stamp of a seal of approval that you are, yeah. just what I was talking about, you're the level one person, well whoever gets to assign the stamp is, is now the gatekeeper, yeah. right? I mean that's, that's also a little dangerous or yeah, but it's the five-year-old test and things are different now. And yeah. so it seems like it's, it's more difficult than engineering where the physics of engineering don't change. Maybe yeah. the material science changes a little bit, but gravity is still gravity. But in the internet or, or the skills, the, 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 the demand for AI or, 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 Ru, or Rust or something yeah. are just changing. So how do you make this a living document? How do you know? What that is. So yeah. first of all, we need to, there are two things in my mind. One, we need to figure out what barriers we've put our, uh, upon ourselves um, and how do we knock those down, right? Do we really need four-year degrees? Do we oh, need, I see what you're saying, you're right. right? Do we need really expensive certification or how do we get people trained and reskilled and upskilled and, and meet them where they are? Right. Not everybody has whatever thousands of dollars to take a training course, right? right? How do we do, and how do we make it so it's sustainable? Right. So one thing is to, break down barriers, the other is to incentivize lifelong learning and feeding the pipeline, right? So what are we doing for K through 12? What are we doing for lifelong learning? Mm -hmm. um, I was just talking to a gentleman that went from IT to OT systems and how he made the transition and now how he's training others to train others, right? right. So how do we make that, how do we scale something like that? And so in the federal government, are you finding particular barriers, like things that we in the, in the yeah. private sector or the market, we don't have those problems, but are there uniquely federal barriers? So one, I'm finding that the private sector is suffering too. Uh, the, what, the one barrier that the private sector doesn't have that the government does have is that you pay a lot more. Yeah. Um, but we have better mission. We have better mission. <laughs> we really do. But in private sectors, they can smoke marijuana, I think. <laughs> 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 I mean, you say there's a, li a quantitative lifestyle yeah. difference, right? Yeah. There's a, I mean, yes. Right. The, uh, people, people do smoke marijuana. That is true. Um, I'm just thinking about when I was at DHS, it was always about suitability. Well, we can't get the clearance because suitability precludes. And it's like you are just walking away from thousands of people who otherwise would be qualified. And I'm seeing it play, for this I'm, I'm seeing it play over again with, with the uh, legislation or legalization of marijuana. It's, you're, you're, you're excluding yourself from all these workers. I know it's not your job to fix that. Hopefully Congress will fix that. But it's one of those things where it's like when you let people in the military have tattoos all of a sudden. Well, all of a sudden, more people can join the military. And I just, like you're saying, what are the barriers? It's yeah. more than pay. I'm just yeah. No, I think I I I, I actually agree with you. Yeah. Um, and I will tell you that we are thinking about how to evolve our policies. And you know, for the most part, we have been evolving our policies around that, so we can meet people where they are. Yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would suggest that if you do smoke marijuana or have in the past, that you can still apply for a job and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's. <laughs> That's what I would suggest. <laughs> okay, if you yeah. think it'll work, then give it a try. Could. Um, so kind of along that, that line, um, it's interesting. Sometimes when I'm working on a, 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 say, a task force, it's U.S. citizens only. And other times, like for CISA, I've, I'm chairing this technical advisory council, I can have people from any planet. I mean, any part of any the planet, planet. Any planet. <laughs> Drink. <laughs> Um, which was great because yeah. now I can tap into people in Germany and Japan and, and if you think about it, you know, our problems are these global problems yeah. and where does the education come in? Where is the skills coming from? It's a globally competitive environment. So again, also can you hire non-Americans or like what are sort of the restrictions? Or they can only be a contractor but not a full time or? No, we can hire, as, you know, we can hire anybody with the right skills. Um, Except Russians. <laughs> well, it, it, there, there have to be some criteria for hiring. Right. Uh, like you need to be 
able to lawfully work in the United States, right? Right. Um, you have to be lawfully here or lawfully able, able to en enter into the U.S. workforce. Um, but we're not necessarily limited by U.S. citizenship, right? Right. Um, which means something very different than someone that's able to lawfully work with us. Um, we, you know, when on all of my travels, I've been a lot of places. I've been to Northern Ireland. I've been to Germany a few times. I've been to Estonia. I've been a couple of other places. Um, we are all having workforce challenges. Yeah, um, not just. Not just us. So our system isn't the, the problem, really. Really, yeah. It's 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 finding opportunities to upskill, reskill, provide foundational skills for the pipeline. We're, I mean, what are we teaching our kids? You know, I've got a couple of kids. You've got a couple of kids. Yeah. Right? You've got a couple two, more. Yeah. Two. Yeah. Um, what are we teaching them? How are we preparing them for this workforce, for this economy? Most of our kids are app natives. They have, were born into this space. I wasn't, right? Right. But how are we training them? How are we upskilling, reskilling, um, teaching foundational skills? That is a common problem I'm finding across with my counterparts. Yeah, it's interesting because normally, there's sort of market forces. Yeah. And so if you need a lot of engineers, the price of engineers go up, you get a lot of engineers. But for decades, market forces for some reason are not filling the gap. Yeah. And I, I mean, I don't have the answer. I don't know if you have the answer, but it's just something to think about. Like, why is the market failing? Um, yeah. I, you know, it's. Because if you could get at that, maybe, or you yeah. could better understand, is it that people feel that to get a higher, like you said, four year college degree, uh, and what I'm hearing is people say that it's hard to hire people with a four-year degrees with a security, because they'll tell you, um, don't use this protocol, it's insecure, and then you ask them, well, can you go configure the router to do that? And they're like, huh? Yeah, like, and no, it's, that's right. We're, w the four-year degrees, we need them for a certain, right? We need yeah. them. So I don't want to say that you should not go get a college degree, but you don't need to. Right. Um, it, so it, we, I guess what I'm saying is it's particularly applied in our space. Yeah. You either know how to configure the router or, or you, you don't. don't right. There's matter? not a lot of faking it. Yeah. Exactly. And so how do we how do we motivate and encourage those skills? How do we incentivize that that work? Um, I've heard that engineers do hacker summer camp because they don't know how to configure a router. Right. They're all in it so that they can become. Um, the CISO or the, the C-suite person. But there are so many other pieces to this that are skill-driven and we need yeah. to figure out how to incentivize that. And I'm, I just, I don't have all the answers, right? I'm the National Cyber Director and I don't have all the answers. Let's make that clear. I need you to help me figure out what the answer Can you, is. Do you have the power to talk to some of your staff and say, hey, go do some research and find oh, out yeah. what X, Y. And then when you do that research, is it sort of, internal only or can you share that and say like, hey, we did a survey to figure out for America what to do, but in doing that we realized here's these, this trend across 10 countries so you can help our partners, you know, and, and allies or, because I have a feeling since you said you're not the only one, we're not the yeah, only one facing this, right? Ones, yeah. If our partners and allies and you're like, hey, Germany, you work on this problem, work on this problem and all together we can challenge, <laughs> or is it everybody feels like, no, no, I need to, keep this information to myself for an advantage? Yeah. Or is there more of a shared sense of sort of, we're all in this together? There is definitely a shared sense of mission. One of the reasons I came back into government, government after leaving for a little while is that I was excited about how we're sharing. Um, it's no longer sort of, give me, it's mine. It's more, let's collaborate, let's, let's figure out problems together. And that's true in this space as well. Um, but one of the ways that we are studying these problems is we issue, I know it sounds wonky, but we issue these RFIs, these requests for information. Um, we've done two so far, no, we've done three actually so far. We did one on workforce back in November. Um, we did one yesterday on open source and we did one, I think that also dropped yesterday or today on regula regulatory harmonization. Um, all of the responses are public. Right, so that we can then use it, mm. we can share it, uh, and we can use it to have a policy conversation to make smart policies. Because I have a fabulous staff, I keep pointing to them in the front row, who are all here to pick your brains around all of our initiatives, um, but we need that input in order to be yeah. able to make effective policy. I mean, what, what other ways could we do that? I mean, we have our standard 
RFI right. process. You could go hire Gartner. I'm sure they'd be happy to <laughs> Do write, a, write a report for you for a few million. Um, and so, <laughs> um, so you mentioned two things. I have to remember to, to cover both of them: open source mm -hmm. and, um, and and partners. And so, um, well, there's a national cyber strategy. There's a United States strategy for internet. CISA announced their strategy. Like. We've got a lot of strategies now, yeah. and we didn't a couple years ago. Yeah. So is you're in the audience and you're like, oh, another strategy. There is a plan to all these strategies, right? They all work. They all actually work together. Okay. Dan Easterly and I talk on a regular basis, right? Um, Nate Fick, who does our international work uh, for the U.S. government, he's the ambassador at large, and I talk on a regular basis. He, they are crafting. The State Department's crafting their international cybersecurity strategy. Right. So we built an API for that. So, so, so paint the picture. You've got the overarching United States yeah. strategy, and that's several years old. Yeah, so we have, here's the picture. We have the national security strategy. And I know I keep saying that cybersecurity is not just national security, and I mean it. It's also economic prosperity and tech innovation, but we are nested under the national security strategy as a national cybersecurity strategy. That is meant to be 10 years in duration, a shelf life of 10 years. And then nested in that, um, we have CISA has their operational strategy. And so that operational strategy is basically how they're going to achieve the goals enumerated in. Right, and they're internally consistent. Right. right? With, our, with the nationals. And it's not, it is not NCD's strategy. The President of the United States signed this. So right. the entire administration is plugged into it, right? We would just held the pen. Um, but CISA's strategy that they just released has plugs into this. You'll see a marriage of what their strategy says and what the national cybersecurity strategy says and what the implementation plan is. So then when State Department has theirs, right, that's an their version and, their, and it goes on and on until, yeah. it's, until everybody's sort of showing how they're part of this. This larger. And is there a level below that or is it now once we get these in a couple years, now this is our game plan, this is what we're doing. No, this is our game plan now. Um, it's the implementation plan that is the, the piece that nests under it. Okay. That really articulates in a transparent way how we're getting to the So if you were in the audience and you're like, okay, I sign on to this national security strategy. Okay, I'm kind of down with this implementation plan. Man, that seems like a cool problem yeah. to work on. Yeah. Right? So it's to the point now where you could sort of see where you could, yeah. you could do your thing. And I want, it would be great if everybody in this room or um, as many of you as that wants to, will go to our website and look at it and figure out, okay, this is the thing that's interesting to me. This is the agency. So you can go contact that agency. You don't have to come through my office. If right. it's this side, you go straight to Jen or Eric or someone else that's around, right? Right. Um, okay, and so the next thing I want to talk about is before open source is the values, right? You yeah. talked about the values. And, um, and so it's my turn to have a little rant oh. on values. Because it really feels like, especially with what's been going on the last year with China and Iran and Russia for sure, a couple years ago I was talking about how I feel that there's a sort of great sorting occurring where it feels like maybe it's economic, maybe it's COVID, but there's pressures on not just the United States but countries worldwide like pick a team, pick a side it feels like. And so, you're, so mentally I've separated it into team rule of law. So team rule of law, you know, team rule, we might not all agree on the same laws. Some might be for end-to-end -end encryption, some may not. But generally we believe in resolving our differences through a transparent or democratic rule of law. You got team undecided, undecided in the middle and they're being pressured by rule of law to, hey, come to our side. Mm -hmm. Or team authoritarian, hey, it's so much easier on our side, right? And, and they're being pulled and my contention is being on strongly on team rule of law, yeah, we don't always make the right choices, but like can you imagine in China Apple suing the equivalent of their FBI to prevent the FBI from cracking their iPhone? Like that would never happen in team authoritarian. Mm -hmm. But in, in team rule of law, you get to fight in public with your government, right? That's, a, that's really powerful. And so those distinctions that allow us to enumerate our values that are really bright lines between us and a team authoritarian, that's like, hey, look, this is what we stand for, bright line. Right. You know, gives us um, more compelling arguments against team undecided. 
hey this is what it means to come out to a, you can see how we operate with law, people don't disappear in the middle of the night, you know there's this, how, how do you take those kind of values and try to embed them into cyber policy or any policy to say, you know, because like you were saying, technology is kind of agnostic but it has human value. Yeah. So that means team rule of law's values, we need to bake those in to make it really clear what we stand for. Yeah. And, and are those kind of conversations happening? Are you thinking about that or? Those are the conversations I'm having right now, you know, here while I'm visiting with individuals in each of the villages. Sort of how do we do that better? How do we, what are the incentives that we need to create in order to make sure that we're incentivizing the use of generative AI, for example, or building generative, building the algorithms for generative AI um, so that they reflect the values that we want to achieve, that we want to maintain, we want to sustain, which is really an inter interoperable, open, free internet uh, that will not allow authoritarian regimes to repress their society, but also preserve American privacy, right? right. How, do we, how do we do that better? I don't have all the answers, but I do know that people are an integral part of cyber. Yeah. It, it, just, it just is. And for that reason, that's the reason why I say people are the most important piece of this. So for generative AI, for example, how are we recruiting, training, retaining talent? How do we incentivize talent yeah. to think well, about it, these values? And it seems if, if you're relying on a uh, sense of mission, then you need to be really clear on, on the mission and the values, yeah. right? Because otherwise you, um, and so if I knew how to articulate it better, I, I would, but it just seems like that's one of our superpowers in team rule of law. We have all this other messy stuff that yeah. authoritarians don't have, but we need to lean into our strengths so every time team undecided is trying to make a decision, our values are clear. Yeah. Um, and one of the things I worry about, um, well not so much worry about, but I, going back to the Apple for an example, um, companies, and I'm curious on your, when you talk to companies, they don't necessarily want to be in the business of bumping heads with the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. So if, if they've built their technology in a certain way that means that the FBI is going to subpoena, they're going to get subpoenas like every day of the week, they're like, well my business model is not to hire 500 lawyers, my business model is to sell phones. Right. So I want to tell my engineers, get me out of this problem. And the engineers say, end to end encryption. We have no information to give them. Mm -hmm. The business says, great, on to selling phones. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you have to also be careful because if you push one way, the market might react a respond a different way, way right? Because yeah. they're not maybe so aligned with. Um, so I also, do you get a lot of pushback from business, or how do you? Yeah. So think about this. No, it's. I, I know we're talking about values, but I can give you very a very specific example on regulations, right? Regulatory harm, because I am a lawyer after all. Right. Um, I, I, <laughs> you knew the line. <laughs> um, you know, businesses don't like to be regulated. Obviously, I, I wouldn't if I were a business. Just for the sake of being regulated, we need to raise minimum cybersecurity requirements. But we worked with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce at the very beginning of the conversation about how do we do this? How do we do this more effectively? And that's how we came up with the idea together of, okay, we can't just regulate our way out of this, but we have to figure out how to harmonize existing regulations and find reciprocity. Yeah. But it's, it was, and so now, the business community is very much aligned and they see themselves in the national cybersecurity strategy in, in a way that was unexpected. But the reason that happened is because we were there having these conversations at the beginning while we were building it, right? You hear Jen talk about secure by design. Well, strategy by design. Like we, at, the, yeah. at the end of the day, we really are need, we need to talk to those that own and operate the technology, yeah. the private sector really is, uh, they're, they're the ones that build the tools. Um, so we have to have a conversation as they're building tools about what those uh, They said are. like a particular concern or something they're really worried about? Well, I you mean. Know, like you can do anything you want, but. The president just sent, you know, signed an executive order a few months ago that prohibits operational use of surveillance technology for national security reasons, right? That's, that's an example. Right, so you can start drawing these bright uh, right. boundaries around so right. companies are like, oh, okay, good, you're not going to take my stuff and... It's clearer now. Yeah. I mean, it's not perfect. There's still conversations that need to take place, but it's clearer now what the value is. And the question is now, how do we get there? Right. And so, you know, we have these conversations. This is why it's important to, to 
for us to go and pick your brains so that we can make smart policies to get us from here to there. First, we agree on the value, yeah. right? Then we have to figure out how do we get there? How do we make sure that we are not operationalizing spyware right. to do harmful things? Right, or mandating people set their computers up in a, yeah. <laughs> right. And so it's kind of refreshing and a little scary to hear it, the conversation around regulation because um, I don't know how many, how many people have been in this field for like more than two decades? Yeah, okay, so yeah. So remember back when um, the market was gonna solve our problems and we were going to uh, have like a consumer report and tell people how insecure things were and like Volvo, mm -hmm. people would buy the more secure product. Remember that? It didn't work out. People bought things that had more features. This is more th things on the box. Um, Bummer. <laughs> Software shrink wrap license prevented public disclosure of problems, right? So you couldn't even have a consumer reports. It was against the software shrink wrap license terms. You couldn't even get your foot in. Okay, that's fine. Insurance companies. So now if you've been around for about 10 or 15 years, right? Insurance, cyber insurance is going to save the day. And um, the insurance companies will know what's more secure. The companies will lower the rates, they'll buy the product. Everybody will emulate those products because they're the clear winners and then we'll all be driving Volvos a different way through insurance, right? And that didn't work out. And now we're looking around like, yeah, what's we don't have any yeah. tools left. Like the only tool left in the tool belt is regulation. Yeah. And sometimes that tool like hits you in the face. Oh. And so, so, but it's the only tool left. And so knowing that you've got to, approach it, it, it sounds like what you're saying is you're approaching it very delicately. We're approaching it intentionally and thoughtfully. So I, let me, so I think regulation is an important tool for uh, sure. So it's my quick follow on one. was I don't know if in the strategy you, you talk about insurance. We do actually. In the. But we talk about in terms of how do we, how do we think about flood insurance, right? What, what, how do we create a backstop? to incentivize insurance companies to do better. And then what are the trade-offs, right? So if right. we create a backstop, then can we then have insurance companies be a part of the solution for identifying appropriate security controls before, you know, to lower your premiums, right? So what, how do we do better with that? So we partnered with the Department of Treasury, for example, to figure out, you know, we had that terrorism backstop mm -hmm. that existed. How do we import that here? How do we take what worked there and see, can, can it be applied in, in this domain? Can it be applied in this domain, right? So well, there are a lot of tools, so we don't want to throw away the baby with the bathwater, you know, as they yeah. say. Um, full disclosure, I drive a Volvo, but you know, the reason why <laughs> is because when I was a kid, I, 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 I used to drive like a little stick shift in, in a little red car, two doors, oh. not, not thinking about kids. But then as soon as I had a kid, I remember as a kid being influenced by all those commercials. Remember the commercials? Oh, yeah, yeah. They would yeah. crash. Yeah. Crash dummies. Yeah. So in my head, I had a kid. I needed to make sure that if I go full speed into a wall, right? I'm not, right? Like, it's a psychological thing. But you know, it, it takes time, right? Oh, that's that was a long time ago. Yeah, it takes time. But regulation is another tool, right? That we can rely on. And it seems like we're starting to acknowledge it and embrace it. Companies don't push back as much against it, right? So now it's more like. They're capitulating. It's like, okay, you're going to regulate me, but do it in this way. Well, do it in a thoughtful way. Right. It's really the message that I've taken. So, you know, trust, you talked a lot about trust earlier today. Trust, in my mind, is part capability and, and part character, right? We're, we're capable. We know how to regulate. Um, it's the character piece that we're building better in partnership with the private sector, those that will be regulated. We've acknowledged now that regulation for the sake of regulation doesn't really get us very far. So right. we need to do better and we need to do it in partnership with those that are regulated. Uh, and that's how we've come up with the idea of harmonizing. Right. right? Finding reciprocity. So, um, so do you, uh, I noticed you fly a lot. I do. And you fly to other countries. Yes. Right. So the national cyber director is not necessarily national. Maybe talk about. Well, like what's going on? Is it just because the international nature of cyberspace requires not just harmonization inside the United States? We've got to get with the EU and coordinate with there. Yeah. So when it comes time to hunt bad guys, it's easier to, you know, like what are the other challenges? Yeah, so there are lots of challenges. We don't have an uh, internet that just 
ends at the U.S. border, right? Neither does Canada, neither does Germany, neither does Mali, right? So my security, our security here, is wholly dependent upon security of other countries. And so I have conversations with my counterparts in other countries on a regular basis because we're in it together. We, you know, we have to make it work, and that's the only way we can make it work. So yes, I am the national cyber director, but it turns out other countries have similar positions, and we're thinking about thinking through similar problems, and we have different perspectives. Right, because you're you're more of a strategic role. You're not a tactical role. No. Right? you've got to give the president advice on the big picture, yeah. and that involves and the actual picture, which is beyond the U.S. border. Right? How do we do that better? Um, but you mentioned regulations. The other piece to that are standards, international standards. I'm again, a wonky lawyer, and so I have a pet rock around what are the EU standards, what are the ISO standards, what are our NIST standards, right. you know, the, and how do ITU they align? Standards, ITU IEC, standards, yeah, right. I, and how do we make that work better uh, so that it benefits all? Is, are you seeing, and I know we're about, we're running out of time, so this is your chance to get in any questions on me, um, <laughs> but are you seeing countries that are sort of weaponize these processes, like, you know, well, we'll just throw a monkey wrench in the international standards body, yeah. and will that team rule of law will just be broken for a while, and we'll, you know. And yeah, there's some attempts. I mean, we covered that a little bit earlier. There's some attempts that way, um, but the U.S. Is, is investing better in international standards bodies in order to be able to really help import some of the values that we all agree are appropriate, right? A free, open, interoperable internet. How do we think that through when we think about standards? How do we contribute to those conversations so that uh, you know, we don't have authoritarian regimes really influencing the values of those standards, which underpin the regulations and cybersecurity requirements? But here's my question for you. Okay. Before we run out of time, because I, I see uh, my goon walking around trying to tell me it's time to wrap up. Um, so you talked this morning with, with Ali Mirakis, uh, who in our office has a great relationship with DHS about sort of the government's role and 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. I'm curious, how do you see this evolving in our partnership in DEF CON in the next five, 10 years? What's your vision? Um, yeah, uh, so how DEF CON has evolved um, in our relationship, I guess, with the government, yeah, with, I and, guess? Yeah, in the policy space. In the policy space. Yeah, yeah so I guess um, when I started, when I was a little, you know, crazy hacker, nothing of consequence was online. You couldn't hurt anybody or anything and it was really hard if you even figure out if you could steal anything beyond free telephone minutes. Um, and as things got online, all of a sudden, sh there's consequences now, mm -hmm. right? People can get hurt and, and that's kind of like the first reality wave when it's like, yeah, it's still fun and games but now there's consequences, right? And that's when law enforcement, politicians, everybody started and at the same time, people, the public started to realize there's these evil hackers out there, criminals, and they co-opted our, our hacking word, but people fear what they don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's also true in policy. And so you have to spend a bunch of time trying to educate policy folks to not be afraid. Right? These are solvable problems. Um, not everybody wearing a hoodie. If you're wearing a hoodie, raise your hand. <laughs> See, there's not that many hoodies, right? Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where are my hoodies at? <laughs> I think my staff's wearing more hoodies than right. Yeah, and so, um, so DEF CON is largely a reflection of the hacking community. Mm -hmm. and so we are not what we were 10 years ago. Um, Consequently, you know, things at risk were not what they were 10 years ago and the asks from government are completely different than they were 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago governments would not be asking for our advice. Um, now it's almost like they're tripping over themselves and not just America, I mean other countries. Mm -hmm. Everybody is trying to figure out what's going on, they want to know the consequences of the technology and they need help that's not a lobbyist or a trade association to give them another perspective so they can balance all these perspectives. And um, and so let me ask you, so, so then why are you, are you here? Oh my gosh, I'm here. Thank you for asking that. I'm here because I need, I need this community to help me make smart policy, right? See, and that wouldn't have been five years ago. Oh, I, I, it's just, it, we, it can't, we can't function without it, right? So I teach in this, on the side and 
one of the things I teach is on, on cybersecurity risk. And so risk is a function of threat, vulnerability, and consequence, right? So the government, for the most part, has signals and things and figure it out, can figure out threat pretty well. Um, where we need the help mostly is vulnerability and like literally vulnerabilities in our technology. What are, what are those and what are the imp what's the impact of that vulnerability being exploited? So we can make smart policies and, and pull the right levers on that consequence and vulnerability piece while you know we're arresting bad guys because we can do that, you can't do that. Um, but that's what, you know, we're not the smartest people in the room, um, but together we can come up with really smart policies and I, I need, I, I crave your assistance in that. One of the reasons why I really like being in cyber is because I get to be around a lot of creative, um, thought-provoking people. And, I, and I've walked around several of the villages and I've found creative, thought-provoking people um, and had really specific policy conversations. And there are things that I think we're going to be able to do as a result of these conversations. And this has just been a day. And it's just, yeah, been yeah, a day. Yeah, like, I, I mean, can you imagine what we can do together if we had constant, thoughtful conversation and interaction? And that's what I'm here to try to encourage. We're in the White House, but we are just, like, you see me, I'm here. I'm, I'm not, like, six feet tall and scary. Um, and I try not to be so wonky, but sometimes I can't help my quirks. But, you know, I, I, we're here because we need your input. And so I would love more thoughtfulness about how we can gather some of that. Yeah, so then I guess to your question, yeah. if I had some master plan for DEF CON yeah. around policy, it's figure, find a path for hackers and researchers and academics that are interested in policy yeah. to learn more about policy and then have interactions with policy. Yeah. And on the other side, people who are in policy, your staff that are interested in hacking, find a way to channel them in and make those two communities meet in a, uh, like in a cooperative, like, environment that's not adversarial. Yeah. It doesn't have to be on the main stage, it can be in the side. But the idea is if we're fostering these communities that intentionally want to work together, I have to kind of get my side yeah. going, right, and more thoughtful about the realities of the limitations of policy and you got to just figure out like, well, here's what you can actually really. Yeah. And then together, you know, maybe if you're interested in this stuff, you can help improve policy. If not, that's great. Go hack something and <laughs> fix the technology. No policy needed. Yeah. But I, it seems like the way the global politics have changed, the consequences of technology, AI coming, mm -hmm. like we can't always hide under, yeah. you know, in a bubble. Yeah. No, and we can't make good, po we can't make smart policy in a bubble. Like this is just, it's just ridiculous. But um, coming here has been really helpful to me. We, we hosted a few months ago Hackers in the White House. I think that was productive. I think we want to do that again, and maybe we want to do that in other areas. Like right. Go where where you are, so that we can develop thoughtful policy. Yeah. Uh, no, I, based in reality. What do you think about? Yeah. That? No, I'm really a big believer in, in diversity of opinion. Oh yeah. Because so much technology has been built in a monoculture and rolled out to the globe, and so fixing that requires a, a very diverse set of experience, life experience, right? Yeah. That's perspectives. Um, you know, uh, we have a very active uh, hackers with disabilities uh, village and you just, how many of you think about designing a room for wheelchair access, hearing impaired, vision, you know, yeah. you have to take everybody into account because when you're fixing the problem for one person, all of a sudden you discover there's another problem. Another problem for another group of people you yeah. hadn't even, you know, and, uh, and I think the power of, of the technology of including everybody is, again, that's our superpower, right? Yeah. We need to show our values. So anyway, right. sorry, get all wound up on this. <laughs> Good. Good. Well, I'm glad you mentioned your superpower um, in diversity of perspective, di diversity of experience, because that is something that we hold near and dear. I mean, in my office, we focus on their four values that I, I sort of talk about in our office. Uh, and, you know, we're an office full of wonks who are cyber, cyber people. One is inclusion and e equity and inclusion. Another is accountability. Another is innovation. We need to be innovative in how we do our mm -hmm. work. And so if we get those things right, and if we work with our com this community, um, we can go a long way. And put transparency in there. Transparent accountability. Accountability, that's okay. That's what that is, right? That's why our action plan is on the website. Right. Um, for anybody to come in and plug into, tell us what's missing, we will evolve it, we will update it. 
based on what you have to tell us. Yeah, so my, you got to talk to us. Yeah, my final thought is building the community, outreach to this community requires building trust. And building yeah. trust is that accountability and transparency. Even when you screw something up, like we've never screwed anything up, <laughs> um, you own it. Yeah, of and course. And you try to do better. Yeah. Um, and I think that's how, um, how you build bridges to this. I think so. Yeah. I think that's right. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you for being in our session.